We have up now uh, Jonathan Corbett, the editor for LWN, and in the, this year's theme of a little bit of history repeating, it's going to be telling us about history rhyming in the Colonel community and beyond. So please welcome Jonathan. Well, good morning. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be back here at LCA. Um, as we just heard, in, in keeping with the theme of the conference, I picked a quote often attributed to Mark Twain saying that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. It turns out that one of the places where history often repeats is in the misattribution of quotes to Mark Twain. He didn't actually say that. <laughs> but it, it sounds like something he would have said, and I like it, so I figure I'm going to go with it. And um, just go through some thoughts on how we got to where we are and what it might say about where we're going and things that we want, might want to keep an eye on as we, we go forward in this adventure. So we'll start at a low level, actually look at a little bit of code, and then go up to more abstract things from that. But let's start with a kernel patch. This is a patch for a trivially exploitable, used after free vulnerability in the TCP protocol code. All right, nasty bug. The good news is it was fixed in 2007. So it's not really a, a vulnerability that we need to worry about. But this is a patch that looks very similar for a trivially exploitable use after free vulnerability in the DCCP protocol code. Now, in a pretty much literal example of history rhyming, we see a function here that was called TCP receive state process, and it became DCCP receive state process because the, the normal mode for history to repeat itself in the kernel is through the time honored copy and paste mechanism. And that is exactly how the DCCP implementers back in 2005 created their protocol codes. They took the TCP stuff, stripped out all the, other, the stuff they didn't need, took off the serial numbers, and put in a new version under DCCP. So you'd like to think that we had this vulnerability in the TCP code, which of course they copied when they copied that code into DCCP. You'd like to think that we would have fixed it at the same time. But this was CVE 2017-6074, right? It lurked in the kernel for another 10 years before somebody thought to look there. And naturally enough, it wasn't necessarily somebody who was friendly to us who looked there. This kind of thing happens quite a bit, where you have bugs that we have fixed, that we've dealt with, but in fact, they exist in other forms elsewhere in the kernel. They repeat themselves. Alviro once said, they're like mushrooms. If you found one, you need to look around for more. The problem that I wish to point out here is that nobody's really doing that. So, if you find bugs in the kernel, there's a pretty good chance that somebody else will find another bug, a similar bug, somewhere else in the kernel in the near or perhaps not all that near future. This is an example of a pretty common pattern of underinvestment in certain areas of, of our whole ecosystem. There are, for example, no end of vendors out there who are willing to put a lot of resources into making Linux work very well on their hardware. And this is a great thing. This is a welcome investment. There are rather fewer who are willing to put energy into, for example, finding security issues, even when we have a, a fairly good roadmap as to where they might be. There are other areas like that. I mean, documentation, for example. <laughs> um, and it's, it's going to lead to an ongoing series of repeating problems like this. If you're interested in the security aspect in particular, of course, you should see Case's talk, where he's talking about what is being done about this, which is a lot of awfully good work. I'm going to instead move on to the area of what I term velocity, in particular the velocity of the development process. This is a, a table that I like to put up in my talks detailing the recent releases of, of the Linux kernel. Right? You see we've got all these major releases, big feature releases with tens of thousands of change sets and all that coming out on a nice regular schedule every nine to 10 weeks, like clockwork, it never changes. Well, almost never. Um, we had a bit of an exception here. But the point is that we've got what is a, a quite predictable pattern with our kernel releases. We know when stuff's going to get out. It's going to get out quickly. But we should remember, if we're thinking about the history of our community, that it wasn't always like that. If you were waiting for the 2.2 kernel after 2.0, you waited for two years to get that. Right? 2.4 was another two years. 2.6 took three years after that. This was a period where Linux was beginning to be taken seriously, was beginning to, be take, beginning to take off. But we had a lot of gaps to fill. We had a lot of hardware support we needed to add. We had a lot of features we needed to add. There were pretty basic things that still did not work in those days. If you were 
developing or waiting for the code to fill one of these gaps, two or three years is a long, long time to wait for it to come through to a, to a usable state in a stable release. So that led to a lot of pathologies because, of course, people didn't wait. What we saw was distributors picking out the patches that they wanted or that their users wanted and backporting them into earlier kernels. Take a lot of 2.6 stuff out of the 2.5 development kernels, backport it to 2.4, release it as 2.4 to something, even though it wasn't that. And um, all is good, except that then everybody's kernel is different, and we've, you've got this sort of mess that nobody's really tested yet. This was worsened by the addition of a lot of out of tree code. I don't know how many people remember the Tux web server, but we actually used to have a web server in the kernel once upon a time, and very, or at least, well, we didn't. We didn't have that one in the kernel, but we had a lot of interesting stuff that was being shipped out of tree by the distributors. And at least led to these monstrous kernels. And then when the new kernel did come out, the distributors found themselves with this incredible load of backported software and out of tree code that they had made work in this one configuration, this one kernel. And it was an incredible pain to take that forward to the, to the new kernel that came up. So this, this led to a lot of pain throughout the, the ecosystem. And we did a bunch of things to deal with it. We, we adopted the short release cycle that I just showed you there. We adopted the upstream first rule to try to do away with the shipping of out-of-tree code, that sort of thing. So we've solved all this sort of stuff. And if you look, we have a nice release process, works like clockwork, and we don't have these problems anymore. Um, this is a slide I ripped off from Tim Bird. He showed it at the Kernel Summit a few years ago detailing for a number of popular handsets at the time, the amount of out-of-tree code that was shipped in the kernel that runs on those handsets. So if you had a Galaxy S5 handset, that, the kernel running on that handset had over three million lines of out-of-tree code shoveled into it. Now, if you think of the kernel as being 20 million lines of code to a first approximation, you can figure out everything you don't need for a handset, which is most of it. You have a few million lines of code left that you're actually shipping. Then you add three million lines of out-of-tree code, and you realize that what you have here is not a mainline kernel. It's not even close to a mainline kernel. It is something that is really the creation of the vendor that shipped that. And this is, this is common for pretty much every device that's out there. That leads to related sorts of um, pathologies. This is the about screen phone screen from my phone, which is not the newest phone, but it's still supported. It's running Android 8 and all that. It has a 31073 kernel running on it. All right, that is what they ship on it. 3.10 was shipped in June of 2013. All right, even the 3.10.73 update is about three years old. 3.10 is 320,000 patches behind the main line. At least that was the case last week. This week is worse. <laughs> now, you can imagine in all those 320,000 changes, there's a whole lot of hardware enablement, a lot of features, a lot of security fixes, stuff that you're going to want in a current handset. And so sure enough, a whole lot of that has been backported. There's all the out-of-tree hardware support that's been shoveled into there as well. And so you've got, once again, this sort of Frankenstein kernel. This stays at 3.10 because any attempt to port, forward port it to a current kernel with all that backported stuff added to it would be really painful. And nobody is going to go through the effort to do that. So this phone will never run anything but 3.10 in a supported sort of mode. So if you think back to what was going on around the turn of the millennium, and you think about what's happening now, a lot of this stuff is going to start to sound a little bit familiar. This is definitely a case of history rhyming, at least, if not properly repeating itself. And it's happening for a lot of the same reasons. A lot of the stuff we saw happening 15 or 20 years ago was because the development process simply could not move fast enough to keep up with what, what the developers were creating and what the users wanted. That is happening again now with, with the mobile world except that the pace has increased quite a bit. What was once a two-year or three-year development cycle is now a few weeks, but it's still too slow. And the process of getting code is, is still too slow. So we see this stuff happening. So we're having to solve it in the same sorts of ways by beating on vendors and tweaking our processes. And there are some good things happening. I think this situation is going to improve over the course of the next five years, but it's going to be slow and then it will probably pop up somewhere else. Different topic, tools, and in particular development tools, the tools that we use to develop the kernel. If we go back to the better part of 20 years ago, there was a, 
one of many extended flame wars on the Linux kernel mailing list because patches were falling through the, the cracks. Developers were sending in work and not seeing it getting incorporated into the kernel. And then sometimes patch sets got put in in a broken way, which has led to this particular exchange, which ended with Linus Torvalds saying, go away, get the hell out of my mailbox, I'm taking vacation, I don't want to hear about this anymore. So this is 1998. If you're thinking, okay, you know, maybe this Linux thing is something I should take seriously. It's not just a toy system that's out there. And then you go on the mailing list and you see something like this, and it looks like the whole thing's about to just burn down. All right? It really did. It was scary. It was scary for a whole lot of people. So there are a lot of reasons behind this, this sort of event that was happening back then. And we had to do a number of things to fix our development process to address this. But there's one really, really basic thing that played into this, which was we didn't have a source code management system. Right? The source code management system was emailing patches to Linus, who would likely not just delete them. And then you do it again, and you do it again, and you look in the, the patches that he would send out and see if the code got in there. So as a result, we have no real history of what happened back in those days, and we had a lot of trouble at the time. But even back then, there were people saying, well, hey, you know, these source code management systems, they're fairly newfangled technology, having only been invented in about the 1960s. But maybe, maybe we should ought to be using one with the kernel. And the answer that would come back was, we can't do that, because none of the systems that are out there will work for our development model. It can't handle our scale. It can't handle our speed. It can't handle the way we distribute development. There's just no way we can use one of these tools. So we have to just keep on doing things the way that we're doing them now. So we went muddled along that way for quite a while, but there were people thinking about solutions. In particular, in 1998, I got a call from a guy named Larry McVoy, who was worried about this and was trying to come up with a design for a source code management system that would work with the kernel, that would work with our distributed development model. This was discussed for quite a while, but it took a full four years before there was something out there that Linus actually started to use. And once this happened, the world kind of changed overnight. It took really just a few months for a lot of our problems to go away once this happened. So that was a good thing. But um, there was also a little bit of turbulence because, of course, BitKeeper was not free software. Right? It was made available for us to use for free, but it was not free software. It had some interesting, interesting features in its license, which a lot of people termed the don't piss off Larry license because um, it tended to change when somebody did something he didn't like. Right? You could use it for free only if you would allow it to log your changes to an open logging server on the internet. Right? You could only use it for free if you were willing to work in the open. If you wanted to work in private, you could pay Larry and he'd set you up for that. Okay? That didn't bother us. We were working in the open anyway. That's, that's how we do things. You couldn't use it if you were working on anything that looked like another source code management system. And this was employed by Larry to shut down some of that kind of work, which didn't fly at all well in our community to, to use the license that way. And um, Larry claimed the right to a lot of the metadata that we were creating when we were doing our work on the kernel. If you could get something out of BitKeeper using the BitKeeper commands, that was cool. If you tried to actually dig into the repositories to do it, he didn't like that. And that didn't sit well with us either, of course because we, we thought that we perhaps wanted to get access to that. So this led to a lot of fights, a lot of flame wars, that sort of stuff, and people pushing the limits, um, certain people pushing them hard enough to create trouble. And um, in 2005, the license was abruptly withdrawn. So we woke up one morning and found that this tool, this tool that we had come to depend on completely to make our development process work had vanished overnight. So this was not a good day. There was no thought at that point of going back to the way we were doing things before. Nobody was willing to do that because we had seen that, in fact, the, the tool had helped us a lot. So instead, Linus went off and wrote a thing called Git and, and changed the world. And things are a whole lot better now. So there are some lessons that I think are worth looking at in the current era when we have people saying that the kernel is using a whole bunch of really outdated tools and we should be look, looking at things like GitHub or various other services and tools that are out there, and move into a more modern age. Um, the first of which being that tools do, in fact, matter. The adoption of BitKeeper and then Git totally changed the kernel development process and really saved the kernel community from itself. 
we wouldn't have been able to do what we did without that. Uh, there's, there's really no other way around it. But, of course, licenses matter. There, there were a number of people in the community who weren't concerned about the use of, of proprietary software in this mode, but otherwise other people were, and we saw in the most graphic way possible the way that proprietary software can go bad and the way that it can be used to try to exert control over your process. Tools can be made to work with our development model. Maybe what's out there now doesn't actually suit the kernel community, once again, but tools can be changed if you work on them, and they can be made to do the things that we need them to do, and the results can be spectacular at times. But free as in beer tools are unreliable, um, because if it's free as in beer and not truly free software, then there's, there's another agenda behind it, and that you can run afoul of that. And finally, I'd like to say that conservatism can really impede process. Conservatism in the kernel community, and the kernel community is a very conservative community in a lot of ways, despite this sort of image we like to have of being on the leading edge of everything. It slowed us down for years with regard to source code management systems and can certainly do it again. So I'd like to bear these thoughts in mind as I think about, for example, a talk that Greg Crow Hartman gave about a year and a half ago about why the kernel development community still uses email. It was a very good talk. It was very well reasoned. Right? Email is a set of free standards that are out there. We control. You can use your own clients to work with it. You can script things nicely. It's searchable, so on and so forth. There's a lot of very good reasons for continuing to use our email and patch-based development process that we have. More recently, Daniel Vetter talked about why GitHub really could not work with, for the kernel community. Again, an awful lot of good reasons why, why this tool is not really going to work for us. So this is all very good reasoning, but we need to bear in mind that kids these days really do see things differently than the sort of increasingly gray group of people who develop the kernel. And some of them come in and they see how we develop things in the kernel community, and it looks like something that their grandparents would have been doing. We might as well be communicating in Morse code. And I think some of them simply go away. I think it could be costing us contributors. So we should ask, when we think about newer tools for the kernel community, is the resistance to going to something like GitHub or other sorts of services like that an echo of the resistance to source code management systems in general? You hear a lot of the same sorts of things about how this will not work for our particular development process. Are we hearing this again? And is conservatism, once again, impeding the progress of the kernel and how the development community works and perhaps costing us contributors? I think we need to keep this stuff in mind. On the other hand, if you think about something like GitHub in particular, you certainly have to say, should we be considering a proprietary service? It's interesting, if you look at the, the deal that you get with GitHub, it sounds familiar. You can get it for free if you're willing to work in public. If you want to work in private, well, you, they'll set that up for you. Right? They control the metadata, only now they have it on their own servers and they have a much firmer grip on it than BitKeeper ever did. There's a lot of very similar things, and I think that depending on a tool like that could lead to some very similar endings. So I think any, any thoughts in that direction have to be thought about that about very hard, and maybe instead we should once again develop a new tool. We have in the past developed new tools for the kernel, and it has changed the world. We just need to do again. All we need to do is define the we who will um, do that, and perhaps some good things can happen. And one final note on tools before I move on. When we talk about our nice email-based system that we have now that is open and free and under our control, I'd like to ask, um, how many of you run your own email servers? Quite a few, but I would expect that in a group like this. Um, but that's, that's you know, roughly half the audience, maybe just under half the audience. Okay, the rest of you are using probably somebody's free as in beer proprietary email service. Okay, those of you who are running your own email services, I would wager have discovered that getting email delivered into those big proprietary free as in beer services is getting harder. It's getting to be a real pain in the butt. Okay, they're, they're trying to fight spam and various other things, and they really just do not care very much about the collateral damage that they cause in, in the process of that. It's getting harder to do that. And if you watch the kernel mailing list, you will see in almost every development cycle 
some developer whose pull requests did not get through to Linux because Gmail decided they were sp sending spam. And so you see kernel developers saying things like, I'm going to get a Gmail account, which I have resisted for years because I need to get my pull request through. And this is not something that, that I like to see. And I think it's a kind of a scary sign. I think we need to think about how free is this platform that we have based our development community on, and will it remain free going into the future? I, I, I think there are reasons to be pessimistic there, and I don't really know what to do about that, but, but I think we have a problem in this area. We like to think of the kernel as being kind of the lowest level of, of the software that we're dealing with based on, on this black box hardware, which is kind of the, the solid rock that we have built our whole structure on, you know, much like the rock that holds up the town of Monarola in Italy. It's just there, it's solid, it doesn't move, it doesn't shift, it's just something we can count on being there. It's just a, a fact of nature. But we got a sign, actually it was just over 20 years ago now. These letters probably mean something to quite a few of you. Right? There was a day when if you fed an instruction sequence into a Pentium process, starting with F00F, you would simply lock the whole thing solid. You would have to, to reset the machine. At least it was in the days when we had reset buttons on our computers. Um, we needed them. It was, it was a, an early sign that there are, there are things lurking in our hardware that are perhaps a bit more complex and a bit more surprising than we would like to see. Eleven years ago, Andrew Tannenbaum came to this very city to tell us that we should be running Minix because that was going to solve a lot of our security problems. Right? That was the, the pitch that he made. And we, we were polite, we listened to him, and then we kind of forgot about it and went on um, working on Linux and being glad that we weren't running that Minix thing. Until last year when we discovered that actually many of our processors have another little processor that are hiding inside of them running Minix, and a bunch of add-on software as well. And rather than making our processors more secure, it was actually quite the opposite of that. It brought a whole set of its own security vulnerabilities with it. The inside what we thought of as the hardware level was a whole pile of proprietary software, bringing with it all of the usual fun things that you get with proprietary software. More recently, of course, we've had another um, indication that, that there are some very interesting things happening within our hardware. That what you think of as hardware it is in fact a bunch of, again, proprietary software engaging in some pretty serious black magic at times and occasionally getting the spells wrong and conjuring up demons. So um, maybe we think that this is the last of these and we've, we've mitigated these and we're not going to hear any more of this stuff. But... Um, <laughs> But, but I kind of doubt that. This, there are a lot of implications on this. There's actually, it isn't on the schedule yet, yet last I saw, but there will be a panel in this room at this time tomorrow where we're going to talk about um, how the community dealt with, with Meltdown and Spectre. I think it's going to be interesting. I'm not really going to get into that here. Instead, I'm just going to make the point that we don't really control the hardware. And what we think of as the hardware is a whole level of again, proprietary software underneath the work that we are doing that can sabotage us in various sorts of, of interesting ways. It's, it's not an easy problem to solve, of course. I would make the point that what we really need is we need openness all the way down. I think we need to redouble our efforts on open hardware and hardware that we control, that we can review the designs of, that we can at least have some hope of verifying that those designs are actually reflected in the hardware that we're running. This, of course, is not a simple task. In fact, if you raise the idea, people will say things, oh, you know, it costs a billion dollars to create a, a competitive processor in, in an open sort of way. And I would like to, to raise a couple of points and answer that. First of all, back in 1983, there was this guy named Richard who said, I'm going to make my own operating system and give it away. And we all said, hey, that'd be nice. I'd like to run that. But I don't believe you can ever achieve that. I don't think you can pull that off. That was a pretty common response back in 1983. To, to Richard Stallman's dream, but we are now running that, that operating system. Ten years ago, the Linux Foundation did a study and came to the conclusion that to recreate Fedora 9, it would cost almost $11 billion, right? We had $11 billion worth of stuff there. 
that it would take $1.4 billion just to replace the kernel. So I would make the point that we have, in fact, managed to muster billion-dollar investments in creating something that is open and under control. I think that we should maybe be able to do this again. And I think we need to, to set our goals more firmly on doing exactly that. Um, there's a lot of things that could be said about copyright issues. I'm not going to address most of them, but there's one thing that I wanted to bring up, just in terms of how copyright relates to the, the world that we work in. How many of you recognize this guy? Quite a few. I actually found one in my junk drawer. This is a QCAT. It's, it's a barcode reader. Back in the dot-com days, some brilliant guy came up with the idea that all he had to do was give away a few million of these things, and people would be delighted to use them to scan barcodes on print advertisements and be taken to the corresponding online advertisement. Because we didn't have enough advertising in our life back in those days, and we really wanted to have more. So um, this was a pretty silly business plan. It didn't work out very well, but this, the dot-com days were like that. Um, but people pretty much pretty quickly figured out that sure it would be nice to have a, a free barcode reader. You could use it to do other things if you could just get, make use of it outside of the QCAT software. Now, this was difficult because it was protected by a leading edge exclusive or based encryption system that, that, that took a few minutes to, to circumvent. <laughs> but, but once people did that, QCAT started coming out and threatening people and saying, you cannot do this. You cannot use our device in this way. And it comes back to what Karen was talking about earlier this morning, right? To use the QCAT outside of the QCAT software was a violation of the copyright on the software running in the QCAT device itself. Right? This was an attempt to use copyright not to directly make money for the sales of proprietary software. It was not Bill Gates whining about piracy. Right? This was an attempt to control the use of a device that you would otherwise think that you owned. Okay, we've seen lots of that over the years. There was a big fuss in the United States last year when farmers started figuring out that the John Deere tractor company was telling them they couldn't fix their own tractors or they couldn't get their buddy to fix their tractor because that would be a violation of the copyright of the software running inside the tractor itself. Farmers are kind of an ornery and independent lot. They didn't like this. And so there's been a lot of um, fussing about that. But if we think about the use of copyright as a control mechanism, I'd like to just think for a moment about one of the most widely distributed pieces of proprietary software out there. And um, you know, I don't know where it fits on the table, but it's going to be way up there. It's a thing called the Google Play Services. This is a proprietary blob that's running on any Android phone. Right? You don't pay for it. It just comes with it. In fact, if you ship an Android phone, you have to ship it on there. It's used by Google to provide basic services to allow you to install apps from the Play Store and to ensure that that nice data stream goes back to Google. It is Google's way of, of keeping control over what is shipped on a phone that you think of as being based pretty much on free software. Right? And Google, of course, being Google, uses it for some things that are good. They've used it to bring some coherence to the Android community, make sure you can install apps across a wide range of devices, all that sort of stuff. But it's also used, for example, to prevent vendors who ship Android phones from shipping a phone based on Lineage OS, if you would rather have that. Right? If you do that, then you can't ship Android anymore. You can't ship the proprietary stuff that comes with Android. And so it is, once again, it's a control mechanism. It is their way of keeping their hands on what would otherwise be a, at least partially free software system. So we see lots of this. We'll continue to see about it. Copyright really isn't about selling proprietary software anymore, although that still happens. But it's more a mechanism for controlling what we do with our devices, even if we think that our devices are running free software for the most part. So we haven't gotten away from it. And I believe the freedom issue is really more relevant in a lot of ways than it has, has ever been as a result of that. So my last topic has to do, I just called it platforms. In a sense, most of the talk has been about platforms in terms of the things that we are building our system on top of and, and the, the stability of them. I'm going to step back a bit now and think about platforms as a computing platform as a whole. The operating system, perhaps the hardware it's running on, and so on. And if we look a little bit further back in history, there's probably not too many of you who remember the days of IBM as the bad old monopolist of, of the computing industry, but it was that. 
it was indeed bad. There was, people would say you never got fired for buying IBM for a reason. Um, but if you've tried to buy something else, and IBM would send its salespeople to your boss, and um, all kinds of really fun things happened in those days. They, they, they totally controlled the, the, the ecosystem for a while. But IBM kind of missed the shift to some smaller computers, um, mini computers that were still pretty big computers, and ceded much of the industry to companies like the Digital Equipment Corporation, which was able to, to take away a lot of that business. And there was a fairly long period where if you had a room with a VAX 11780, you were in, you were in Fat City. You had, you had really the nicest stuff that you could have. But DEC2 missed out on a shift here. Right? They missed out on the shift to Unix-based things, what we were calling Unix workstations in those days. Only we didn't really have one of them anymore. We had a whole bunch of incompatible buggy Unix systems out there all competing with themselves. We had what we called the Unix Wars. And this is, I think, part of why the era of, of Unix dominance of at least a portion of the computing industry was rather shorter than one might argue it should have been. It didn't actually last all that long. And part of it was all of these companies each trying to control the platform and trying to take it in their own direction and fragmenting the whole thing and making it all such a mess that people didn't want to deal with it and leaving an opening for this thing called Windows. There was a brief period out there, a very dark period, where it looked like Windows was going to take over everything. Right? The Unix workstation vendors were preparing their NT workstation products I was working in a, in a national supercomputing center at that point. We were being told that, that the supercomputers were going to shift over to a Windows-based machine at some point. This, this was not really a, a nice view of the future. We were not pleased with it. But um, something interesting happened that derailed that, which was, of course, that Linux came along. And while it certainly didn't bring an end to Windows, it definitely brought an end to the dream of Windows dominating the entire computing industry. And rather than having Windows, we now have Linux dominating much of the computing industry. There's certainly no talk of putting Windows on supercomputers these days. But there's also no talk of putting Windows on phone handsets or anything like that. Uh, outside of the desktop environment, we, we dominate pretty much the whole thing. So this, this is pretty impressive when you think about it. We, we set out to change the world years ago, kind of just trying to do what we could do. And we won, right? We won. We succeeded beyond really what are our wildest dreams of what we thought we could do. Nobody thought that we could get to this point where we dominate much of the industry and we have a fair amount of control over the systems that, that we build our software on, on the systems that we're running. It's not complete. It's certainly not perfect. But it's far better than we really had any right to, to hope for back 20 years ago, something like that. It's an amazing success. So it's natural to think that, OK, we, we have succeeded. We have won. We, we did this. And this, is, of course, is the way that things should really be. Because what we have now is a better alternative than anything that's out there. And there's not much in, in sight that's going to displace us, that's going to push us aside. And so to that, I would like to bring up a couple of quotes. So I almost remember back in the 1990s, somebody asked Ken Olson about this, this Unix thing. And he came up with this classic response that was published in a trade rag back then, saying that his belief was that serious users would run out of things they could do with Unix. They'll want a real system. And they will end up doing VMS when they get to be serious about programming. Right? The beauty of Unix is that it's simple. The beauty of VMS is that it's all there. Well, VMS, of course, wasn't there at all for a whole lot longer than this. But it's worth noting that a guy, Ken Olson, right, was the, the CEO of DEC, somebody who had transformed the computing industry, who was, you would think understood it pretty well, who had made some major changes, had made things better in a lot of ways, totally failed to see this, this massive threat to, to his dominance of a big part of the computing industry and was completely blindsided by it. 2003, Jonathan Schwartz, the CEO of Sun, said, wanted to be really clear about their Linux strategy, their Sun. We don't have one. We do not believe that Linux plays a role on the server, period. Well, that didn't work out very well for Jonathan Schwartz either, um, needless to say. 
And he too was totally blindsided, as the sun people were totally blindsided. In fact, if you go out, if you can find a proper search for terms like sunset out there, you'll see there are still people who don't really understand what it is that happened to them and think that some massive injustice came along and displaced Sun and Solaris from its natural place at the top of the computing heap. Right? They, they simply they did not see it coming. And even now that it has come and gone, they still don't seem to see it. So you should maybe be thinking about this and asking, well, what is it that we don't see? What might be coming along that might blindside us in the same way that that our predecessors got blindsided because it's a, a recurring pattern in the industry that this happens. We've had a lot of systems, a lot of people dominating in various phases. It never lasts. Do we really think that we're different? Do we really think that our way of developing software is different? So, you know, I don't know what's coming along next. I don't I think be blindsided too. But you see some pressures out there now. A lot of interest in creating a kernel and a system based on it that, for example, is much smaller and more nimble. The Linux kernel is huge. That gives it a lot of inertia, both with the software base and in the community that, that drives it. Right? It's, it's very hard to change it quickly. It's very hard to, to control it. It's very hard to get things going that way. And especially if you think about the smaller systems, the systems that you might, say, put into a heart defibrillator or any of the other small systems that we hear are going to be surrounding us by the thousand everywhere, right? Linux is not necessarily the best adapted system for these sorts of deployments. And there are, there are companies out there that would like to see something else. They'd, of course, like to see it permissively licensed because that um, gives them, and it gives them some freedoms that they would like to have at the, you know, at the most benign edge of just not dealing with the hassles of GPL compliance or at the less benign edge of taking things proprietary. And there is a lot of interest out there in having an operating system that a company itself controls. And this is something that we should bear in mind, because one of the real strengths of, of Linux and the whole system that has built, been built around it is that no one company controls it. It is its own thing. It is its own community. And there is no company that actually controls it. There are companies with influence. Some of them have a fair amount. But nobody controls it. All the companies out there using Linux have benefited immensely from this model of having a system that nobody controls, that is out there, that is developed with the interests of really the entire user base in mind. But that will not stop them from saying, OK, that's fine. But now I would like to ship a system that I control, that I am in, in charge of. And so we're going to see pushes in this direction. So when you hear names like, I don't know, Zephyr or Fuchsia, you should be thinking in terms of, of this sort of thing, of creating a smaller and nimble system that some company can control on its own. And if, if we are not able to, to respond to that kind of threat, we may find ourselves blindsided in the same sort of way by some small little system that looks perhaps like a toy, but which better meets the needs of some companies with resources that are willing to drive it forward. So um, if we want to continue to have our kernel that, in some sense, we control, we need to come up with a response to this. And I don't honestly know what it is. Because history suggests that, that Linux is not forever, and that what comes after it may or may not be as good as what we have now. So on that, um, I'm pretty much out of things to say. I can sort of reiterate a few of the, the points that I made. I do have five minutes for questions, I am informed. So if anybody has any questions, I would be glad to answer them. I think we have a microphone, so you should wait for the mic. And then we can um, go from there. Does anybody have any questions? Or have I put you all to sleep? <laughs> all right, we have a couple back there to the right, yes. Um, so you said that, um, oh, it's weird hearing my own voice, but um, <laughs> you said that Linux has dominated like outside of the desktop world like successfully. What do you think was the reason or the main reason why it didn't happen in the desktop like world? 
the main reason why it didn't happen in the desktop, why we didn't dominate the desktop, I think, I mean, one can come up with a lot of things, but I think that by the time we were in a position to really contend for it, there were a lot of, there was an incumbent vendor there that was already pretty well established. And, you know, just to displace somebody like that, you have to be not just better, but quite a bit better. The ways in which we were better were not really visible to, to the people who were buying desktop systems in those days, and perhaps still are not, because I still don't think we've really made the point of, of how important freedom is in these areas. So it was, it was always a hard sell to try to displace that vendor in that way. There are a lot of other reasons, and you know, one can talk about the desktop wars or any of a number of other things, but I think that's really the core of it right there. Uh, so with saying Linux is not forever, is one of the huge benefits uh, the fact that it is open? Is openness going to help whoever comes over the top, or if something comes over the top, openness because it allows anyone to get involved. Sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't quite It's openness. Like the fact Linux is open has helped it dominate to the extent it has. So is openness the thing that gives it such a huge advantage? I believe it has, yes. You know, I, th I think the openness is good. If you look, you know, if you look, for example, just our success in the industry, the, the computing industry actually really loves free software. At least they love to use it. Right, it's it's a very nice input to to their products, and it's a very nice way to take the air out of what perhaps some other company is charging for. So, openness in that sense, I think, has been very good for the success of Linux. I think openness has also really helped to enable all of the all of the all of the players, or at least those who are willing to participate, to influence the direction of Linux in the way that they need. It has a lot to do with why we have a system that works on very small systems and very large systems and in very many different kinds of use cases because there is room for the influence there and not allow one particular constituency to, to push aside the others. Right? That we really have been able to make a system that is almost all things to all people. So I think openness has helped us quite a bit in those areas and more. You mentioned... Um uh, you, you, you mentioned Google using uh, TalkBack, aka Play Services, to um, essentially discriminate against vendors that also support things like Lineage OS. Do you have a concrete example to back that up, as in an example of when Google actually used that kind of enforcement, or is that, just, is that currently sort of a looming threat that hasn't actually been exercised? You know, I, I can't point you at it, but, but the agreement that you have to sign to, to ship that simply disallows it. Okay, so I don't think they've ever had to enforce it because the companies know what they sign and they haven't really tried it. So you, know, you can see someone like you know, OnePlus who will ship something else, but then they aren't shipping Android. And that, that leads uh, to issues for them, right? It makes it harder. Getting back to the question about <clears throat> email versus GitHub and perhaps having problems with GitHub being a corporation that could repeat uh, the problems with BitKeeper, I don't understand, given that the Linux Foundation seems so wealthy and powerful and able to organize a lot of really good efforts like the Core Infrastructure Initiative, I don't really understand why they don't launch an initiative to help at least investigate some of these problems. It, it, it seems like the problem you're referring to is widely recognized, so I don't understand why, say, we don't have static analysis tools, why are so many of these initiatives started by volunteer efforts or, or individual companies? That, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, but what I can, what I will say is that the Linux Foundation is at its core a consortium of companies, right? And the things that the Linux Foundation pursues are the things that people are willing to go to them with the resources to support its pursuing. So with the core, initi core infrastructure initiative, and that, that actually was somewhat initiated from within the Linux Foundation, but it still required a bunch of the companies to come in with resources to fund it, to make it happen. Right, so the way the Linux Foundation works, if you can create a pitch that will bring that sort of resources in, the Linux Foundation will be your friend on something like this, right? They will, they will do it, and they will support a number of good things or perhaps not so good things on that. But it really is based on, on getting 
the funding behind it. So if you can't really get some interest in the industry in making it happen, then the Linux Foundation is essentially a representative of industry. It is, is not going to do that. So I've tried a few times to get them to put support behind things that I thought was, were important. And sometimes I've had some success, sometimes I haven't. But they can't do everything, and, and they're less likely to just pick up a new project from the beginning and, and push it forward on their own initiative like that. All right, well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for uh, entertaining the audience. On behalf of the organizers, I have a gift for you. And everyone, you. please give a round of applause to Jonathan. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you all.